city that always looks better just after it's been dusted. It's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, comedian Andy Kaufman, sex therapist Dr. Ruth Westheimer, and look at the oddest dogs in the world. And now, a man who believes if he stands very still, the world won't come to an end, David. Awfully, uh, off thank you very much. Awfully, awfully darn nice of you. Welcome to the show, and boy, what a show we've put together for you here tonight. First of all, let me uh, bring you up to date on a couple of things. It's official now. Billy Martin is once again the manager of the New York Yankees. Is this Steve Jordan uh, booing vociferously, and uh, see, I can almost understand why Steve's angry. There are still hundreds of people in this country who haven't had a chance to manage once. <laughs> In football, though, the NFL player strike is over, and uh, the reports from the New York Giants, they are in mid-season form. Uh, <laughs> during the strike, the quarterbacks uh, practice throwing interceptions, so they're ready to go. <laughs> We have a fine show for you tonight. <laughs> Comedian, and not a minute too soon, Andy Kaufman is here tonight. <laughs> we have some sort of a pneumatic leak in the audience tonight. We have a high pressure hose has burst here, ladies and gentlemen. My God, the humanity, it's just awful. Uh, you were hissing Andy Kaufman, weren't you? Yeah, well, I st we'll talk about that. I think that's fair. I've hissed him occasionally myself. And uh, also on tonight's program, sex therapist Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And without tipping, well, I'll go ahead and tell you, they're announcing, announcing their engagement tonight. Andy and Dr. Ruth are... And then they'll be wrestling at uh, Holiday Inns all over the United States, uh, in the lounge, right there, a big mud ring and everything. It'll be pretty exciting, and drive safely, won't you? Well, um, oh, this is interesting. From uh, There's a recent issue of Geo Magazine had some of the most peculiar dogs in the world, and I understand that we have them here tonight. That'll be interesting to look at. At this point, say hello to now, <laughs> either way you want to say it, Paul Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah. Swings wild. You swing wild. You really do. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I don't have to tell anyone in this studio audience that next month, the daytime soap opera, The Doctors, is going off the air. Now, it's always a very... No, no, no. This is very sad. Uh, it's very sad when a program ends. They have been on the air, I believe, 20 years. Now, naturally, everyone wants to know how... Will the series come to an end? And since they taped the show right here in our building, the RCA building, we thought that we would go down there to their studio on the third floor and find out. Now, obviously, I can't go. I have to stay here and look at the world's most peculiar dogs with you folks. So uh, what we need are volunteers from the studio audience. It was interesting, uh, behind the scenes, a man was nearly knocked unconscious by a camera lens right here, four feet from me. Uh, what we need now, some volunteers from the studio audience to go down there and find this information uh, for us. And I believe we've pre-selected some folks. And if you have been pre-selected, please come down here. And they're there. They're working their way down right now. Thank you very much. Here they are. Do you have any soap opera music, Paul? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, that's very nice. How do you do? What is your name? Betty Wilson. Betty Wilson, nice to see you. And your nice name is? You. Wells Hahn. Wells Hahn. Hahn. And yes. where, are you, where are you from, Wells? I'm from Houston. I lived there for a year. I'm from New York. Uh-huh. That's quite a little story you've put together. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you do?
you do for a living, Wells? I'm a sales rep for a PA firm in Houston, Texas. Okay, and and uh, Betty, what do you do for a living? I'm a housewife. Uh -huh. in, in Houston? Mm -hmm. Oh, this, uh, do you know one another? No, no, we just met in the lobby. Well, this could be exciting, <laughs> couldn't it? Uh, ha have you seen the, uh, the program, The Doctors, Wells? No. And Betty, how about yourself? No. Okay, if you watch the monitors, let me give you some inform information uh, that you're going to need in, uh, in pursuing this. We're going to find out how the uh, show ends. So if you just watch the monitors. Now, this is the cast of the doctors right there. Uh, don't let their smiles deceive you. <laughs> if they know anything about how the series will end, they'll kill you before they talk, it says here. Now, this is Alec Baldwin who portrays Billy Aldrich on The Doctors, or he did. Alec was secretly investigating how the series would end when his character was brutally murdered on last Friday's show. <laughs> He's young, debonair, and so very, very dead. <laughs> this is Tony Randall and Swoosie Kurtz. They're stars of the NBC hit series Love, Sydney. They're sympathizers with The Doctors, so watch out for them Saturdays at 9.30, 8.30 Central Time. <laughs> This is, of course, the Statue of Liberty. If you see her, it means you've gone too far and have more than likely left the building. Now, uh, I tell you what, we're going to have to change your identities because if you're caught, we can't uh, be responsible for you. Your name is Betty Williams? Wilson. Betty Wilson, all right. We'll change it to Betty Will Williams. Williams. All right, remember that. And your husband's name is? John. John, we'll change his name to Jim. Okay. okay. And uh, you're? Uh, Wells. Wells, all right. Wells, I tell you what, we have a, a passport for you here. Uh, this, by the way, is the actual size of passports in the... <laughs> Uh, no, I think actually real passports are much bigger than this one, but now, uh, Wells, we would like you to assume the identity of Laszlo Kruger, it says here. You were born in Vienna of Russian parents, though you carry a Turkish passport. Well, that explains the size here. Um, you were educated at Oxford and currently reside in Switzerland as a ski instructor. How is your Swiss-Austrian accent? Not bad. Could you try a little? Not bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's perfect. There you go. Just cover your mouth with a passport. Now, um, uh, I tell you what, uh, Betty, we're, we'd like you to pose as a, uh, you're here just as a tourist, right? On my honeymoon. On your honeymoon? Yes. Oh, well, yeah. isn't this you? That, that's exciting. When when were you married? October 2nd. October 2nd and, uh, oh, so, so I guess it's still a, a, it's a long honeymoon, isn't it? About a month and a half for you. <laughs> How long have you been in New York? Uh, one day. One day. And you drop the bags off at the hotel, race right over here, huh? <laughs> okay, here, Betty, I want you to, you'll be the New York City tourist. Now, uh, uh, when you're touring New York, it's important to, to wear the, the I Love New York stuff. Now, this, if you're followed, if you're followed at any time, just pull this little ring here, and this will put down an oil slick. <laughs> Sir, sometimes rehearsal might help. There you go, Betty. Um, put down an oil slick. Poor woman on her honeymoon. She's knee deep in oil. Um, all right, and here is this uh, camera. We want you to take a lot of photographs, Wells. Uh, we need to find out how this story comes to an end. Put that on. It's disguised by this tie. They really won't know you've, you've got it on there. There. Okay. All right, now, uh, one more thing, uh, 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 Betty and uh, Laszlo. Uh, you're going to need a guide. So, ladies and gentlemen, the actor who played Billy on The Doctors, meet now Alec Baldwin. Alec? <laughs> Alec, thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, Alec is uh, working for us now since his character on the show was killed off, and uh, I understand you're bitter. Is that correct, Alec? Uh, that's right. I I'm bitter. And, uh... <laughs> I'll do anything I can to destroy the doctors as they destroyed me. Okay, so on, on that note of optimism, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to send you on your mission. Good luck and report back to us when you find some information about how the uh, series comes to a conclusion. Thank you very much, sir. Good luck to you, Betty. If you'll just go right up there. And uh, Alex. There they go. Mr. Andy Kaufman there, right after this commercial. Thank you, Paul. 
Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen, and a fine program it is. Uh, it seems as though whenever my first guest is on this program, there is a great deal of excitement and anticipation in the air, it says here. And why should tonight be any different? Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the star of NBC's Taxi, <laughs> the irrepressible Ricky Nelson. No, no, no. Irrepressible Andy Kaufman.
right there. We'll, uh, we're going to pause. We'll be right back, and then you can hiss more at Andy Kaufman. <laughs> Tomorrow night, uh, be sure and join us, as they say when they want you to be sure and join you. Uh, <laughs> uh, comedian Pee Wee Herman and Devo will be here tomorrow night, along with uh, viewer mail, and uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer will be joining us, plus some odd dogs. Now, uh, and Andy Kaufman is here tonight, speaking of odd dogs, but you know, no, just a, just a joke. Um, when you read criticism of your performances, do you ever, uh, you know, take it to heart and think, well, maybe there is something I can do to, to change Sure, I always, uh, uh, and I, I just want to make one thing clear, is that I am not in any way complaining about the press. Mm -hmm. I highly respect the press, and they've always been very fair to me. I'm just complaining about the certain people like this, just a handful of the writers and producers who are in power who are trying to... Who, it, it reeks of McCarthyism to me. And, 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 they're, and, they're, and it's worse... It, it reminds... No, really, you, uh, and I don't know why everybody's hissing, but, 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 but it reminds me of, of blacklisting, and it's worse than blacklisting because they're trying to stop me from appearing on television. Why? Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I think I have the right to appear on television. Well, you're on now. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you. But I, I'm you, you can't be on every minute of your life, Andy. No, but you're, but 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 yours is. The, but I'm on your show. Your, I mean, yours is the best show. You, I, I, your, yours is the only show that will let me on. Well, that that me. I mean, sooner or later. I mean, but you're on a hit uh, another show. This is like a part-time job for you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Have you, have you, uh, well, give me an indication of something that, uh, uh, some criticism you've had that's made you think twice and, okay. and uh, say, okay. yeah, for they're instance, right. The, for instance, I mean, even when, when the critics in general even put me down, there are many times I agree with them. They've always been fair. For example. Been, for example, when I made that movie Heartbeeps, and I, I got terrible reviews, and I rightfully saw it was a terrible movie. And I'm embarrassed, <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I was in it. And I, and I just want to say about that is that I did not write it, direct it, produce it. I had nothing to do with it. I was hired to act in it, and because my name was up there, people think it was, oh, my movie. Well, I just want to say to, the, to my fans, if there are any out there, that, that uh, I would like to personally apologize to each and every one of you for me being in that movie. And I mean, the, the people, now, the people who worked with me in the movie, the director, producer, the writer, they were all very wonderful people. It just didn't come out right. The movie just did not come out right. And, and uh, I want to apologize to all of you who saw my name and you went there because you wanted to see me in a movie and you were very disappointed. And it's the truth of the matter is I am right now working with my lawyer on a plan I would love to be able to personally give back the money that all of you paid <laughs> for your admission price. And I am right now working on a plan where I can legally do that out of my pocket, refund everybody's admission price back. Well, make, make sure you have change for a 20. <laughs> um, this is true. Oh, this is true. <laughs> Wait, I didn't I was, it. No, it was just a what? joke. Never mind. It didn't mean a thing. It's just my way. It's just a little joke. Occasionally, I'll get in there. Yeah, and but what does it mean? It, it means that it, oh, it may be the... Maybe what it, what it means is maybe the, the movie didn't do that much business anyway. It didn't. Oh. Oh, no, it didn't. Hardly anybody saw it. That's why I'm willing to give them the money back. Uh, Andy Kaufman, ladies and gentlemen. Good luck to you, Andy. Thank, Thank you for you. stopping Thank by. You. Andy Kaufman. Thank you. Andy, thank you very much. Uh, our staff spotted uh, an article in a recent issue of Geo Magazine entitled Odd Dogs, and the article takes a look at eight of the most uncommon breed of dogs in the world, eight of the most uncommon breeds of dogs in the world, and tonight we're going to meet a few of those dogs in person. Uh, welcome now, if you will, please, Kirk Ferguson and her poolie, it says here. Kirk? <laughs> Hi, Kirk. How are you? This is uh, this is uh, oh, good heaven. 
Better get that back to the mop room. This is, uh, that's the strangest darn dog. Now this is a, uh, did I pronounce it right, Kirk? Pooley. A, a pooley? Yes, okay. people who don't like the braid pronounce it pooley. Pooley. Well, now what? I'd rather have him call it a pooley. How, how rare an animal do we have here, Kirk? We've got about 319 registered in this country. Oh, that's uh, hardly any, isn't it? Quite a few in yeah. Europe. They're and Hungarian dogs. They are, for, that was, the, now why, uh, uh, most dogs uh, were bred for certain characteristics to use in, in, in practical application. What would be the reason for, for this? <laughs> tell me that this is the most superb sheep herding dog in the world. Now, wh and why would that be, uh, why would they be good for sheep herding? Well, the size, the size is just right. The coat protects them in all kinds of weather. And the dog's temperament is... Uh -huh. Is this the dog that actually gets on the back of a sheep? So legend has it, yes. so, Now, what is that legend exactly? Well, National Geographic in 1944 said that these dogs rode the back of sheep. Um, I've never seen it. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, you mean as a, just for fun or as a way to, as a to, way to, to get him back? Now, are they pretty... Now, how does this happen? Now, you didn't do that, did you? He did that himself. Oh, isn't that sweet? He did that himself. <laughs> Yeah. Three years. <laughs> now, what, how does this happen? This is just like a wool that's been braided. That's this is amazing. Right. That's the top coat tangling with the bottom coat or the undercoat. And it forms what we call cords. That's unbelievable. Now, is, is the dog hot in there? Are you hot, Box? <laughs> that's amazing. So, so th this is a pool. And, and you're pretty happy with the dog? Is good temperament? I'm very, very fond of this dog. Yes, I am. All right. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you, Kirk, and also your dog. Uh... What, was your, what was your dog's name? My dog's name? Yes. Box. Box? We call Box? Him Box. Nice. Good. It's the strangest looking thing. Uh, thank you very much, Kirk. Nice meeting you. <laughs> you see the coat that woman left with? My word. Uh, this next breed of dog is a Basinji, and uh, John Sansever is the owner of the Basinji. John? Hi, John. How are you? Did I get your last name properly? That's right. Sansever? Uh, what can you tell us about the, this Basinji? Okay, it's the only barkless dog. Okay. It now, yodels it, when it's happy. Yodels. Yeah, it's oh. like a hyena uh -huh. or a wolf or a coyote, any of the wild canine dogs. And wh why, like why is the dog barkless? Well, they've been like that for centuries. There's a legend that states that in the, first, the Old Testament that when Moses was freeing the children from Egypt, uh, these dogs were alarming, you know, barking at the children and... <laughs> you're spooking them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And... Uh, Hi. <laughs> they stated that no man or animal shall speak against the children of Israel. And they said since then the dogs have been mute. Uh -huh. Do they, they ever make any noise at all? Well, they growl, uh -huh. they whimper, they clean themselves like cats. You never have to. They, they lick their coat, actually? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. no dog odor, and they're non-allergenic. Uh huh. Well, that uh, comes in handy, I guess, if uh, <laughs> right. when you're picking out clothes for them. I, uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, is, uh, is this, John, the, uh, the dog that actually will cry if, uh, if she is upset? Well, okay. Okay, legend has it that when they're in pain, they've been known to cry real tears. My first Basenji bitch, when she gave birth, actually cried the tears. <laughs> That's a female dog. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. And she actually did cry tears? Yes. Aww. And the other two I had did not, so it could just be... A certain few. And and what is this dog's name? This is Solo. Solo. She was the only puppy Not, born. Good in the pet. Water. Excuse me. Good pet. Good pet. She's a okay. show dog also. And they're the core, uh, the country of origin here. Do you know? Africa. Africa. And Egypt. Africa and Egypt. Very fascinating. Nice meeting you and your sure. dog, John. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Goodbye, Solo. The Basenji. Uh, dog number three is called the warmest breed. Its body temperature is 104 degrees, uh, two and a half degrees higher than the most dogs with hair. Please welcome John or Joan Orlick and her Chinese crested. Joan. Whoa. Hi, Joan. How are you? Hello, just fine. And, and what is your dog's name? Uh, this is uh, Buddha. Buddha. And what, what can you tell me about the, uh, the Chinese crested? Well, they've been around this way for 
or around 20,000 years. Ooh. He's warm. very warm. Now, why why doesn't the dog have any uh, fur there? The dog has no fur because it uh, it lacks millium. Uh, it lacks what? Millium. Millium. Well, don't you worry. We'll get you millium. <laughs> We're going to stay on the air until we raise enough money to get this dog some millium, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the phone. That's a fascinating dog, and, and uh, the, I understand the dog actually will tan? Yes. Uh, when you take them out in the sun, you have to put suntan lotion on them, or they'll burn just like people. And their, their claws, they have uh, different kind of paws? Yes, he has uh, little hands. He has an extra bone, a joint, in his toes. <laughs> and if he would, he could grasp your finger, but he won't. Yeah. Does it make a good pet? Yes, very. Terrific. Thank you very much. Pleasure meeting you, John. Thank you. That was a Chinese crested, ladies and gentlemen. Last but not least, the most expensive dog. Please welcome Diane Epstein and her family of Chinese Sharpays, I believe. Hi, Diane. Nice to see you. <laughs> now, are these Sharpays? Is that these correct? Are and uh, they're a very expensive dog. Yes. How much, for example, for one of these guys? Oh, about twenty-three hundred. Now, do they come with the down jacket? <laughs> Look at this guy back here. What's the, what's the deal on him? Come on out here. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Get in the ball game here, will you? Uh, and you said twenty-three hundred dollars for one of these? Yes. And they, these dogs are instinctively housebroken. Can that be true? Yes, it is. So they come ready to go, uh, so to speak. Yes. But, but they provided you take them out. Yeah. Often enough. Uh, now, how? how uh, uh, <laughs> and their their country of origin is China. China. These are fascinating Southern dogs. Southern China. Southern China. And uh, was there any purpose in breeding them like this? Well, no. They were originally a utility dog for the pe uh, peasant farmers, uh -huh. and then later on things got dull, and they decided to uh, use them for fighting. <laughs> fighting dogs? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. their temperament really is not for fighting. They make good pets? Excellent pets. Thank you very Extremely much, Diane. Incredible. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Uh, Diane Epstein. Thank you. We'll see you guys. <laughs> dispenses sexual advice on her own radio and TV shows here in New York City. She is also teaching at West Point. Uh, we'll ask her about that and other things. Welcome, please, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Hello, Dr. Ruth. We have a little uh, cushion there for you. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back. Is this uh, possible? You're teaching at West Point. What is, uh, uh, how did that happen? What do you teach there? Um, I teach a course, and it's a very exciting, about family life. And I'm teaching it to career soldiers who are responsible for a lot of men who come to them for advice. So what we do is really give a course in family life, uh, of course with a component of human sexuality, mm -hmm. because I can't give a course about family life without talking about sex. But it's very exciting because these are experienced men I have these, one are these woman. cadets these no, people no these are professional soldiers oh and there are i have 35 men and one woman in the class and it is very fascinating because these people are mature people who want to learn and uh, so we do a combination of really talking about family life and all of the problems but specifically geared to the military because they do have some special problems like uh, people having to move 
to Korea, to Germany, sure. all around, and what it does to the family, what it does to the stress in the family, what it does to the discipline of the children, and so forth. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. You should come with me up there once. Oh, I don't think so. No? I mean, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would, I don't mind going away with you. I just don't think I'll be going to West Point no? with you. No, that's all right. Thank you very much. I like it up there on the point. Oh, it's beautiful. I understand. Somebody said I'm the shortest instructor on the point. I, yeah, I think that's probably so. Um, <laughs> and congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Uh, now, um, <laughs> <It's a laughs> we, uh, we have some uh, questions from our studio audience, which we always have. Uh, let's get right to those, shall we? This is the kind of thing that Dr. Ruth Westheimer does on her radio show. Uh, for those of you around the country who don't uh, get W.I. Wait, I forgot to tell you something. Uh -huh. uh, talking about West Point, you know what's interesting? Um, people like myself, I have a lot of fun with you and dogs and all the rest of you, but... <laughs> keep my two feet on the professional ground. I just finished a chapter in a medical textbook mm -hmm. for physicians to teach them to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. So now ask me the questions. Yeah, would you think you were the shortest person to write a chapter for that book? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Congratulations again. <laughs> um, Oh, now this is interesting. This would be a question that I want, I want to know something about. This comes to us from a 20-year-old female. Uh, does the theory of the female G-spot have any scientific or medical proof behind it? I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad she asked it. <laughs> because that is the type of question. You see, the G-spot stands for Grafenberg spot, and there are some people who are saying that there's a special spot in the vagina, right next to the urethra, that if properly stimulated would bring about a different kind of an orgasm. But let me tell you something important. It's supposedly a killer, isn't it? I'm not saying that. <laughs> Just what I, I've heard. I am very careful until, I'm really glad you asked, David, uh, or that lady asked it, because until we have more scientific grounded data until people, physicians, gynecologists, really do a study like on a couple of thousand women. I don't want even to talk about mm -hmm. it. You know why? I don't want a woman to go home to her husband and say, you stupid, how come you haven't found a G-spot? <laughs> so I am very careful. A if lot they of pressure bring, there. That's yeah. <laughs> no, it would. It would yes. create a lot of pressure on them. Because we don't know. We really don't know. We don't have scientific <laughs> evidence that there is such a thing. Yeah. Until we do, then I'll come back on your show and I'll tell you, hey, we found something new. Until then, let's teach people to have good sex with what we know they do have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But if you hear anything in the meantime, phone me. I promise. Um, let's see, this next question comes also from a female, 22 years old. I am married to a wonderful guy and have a beautiful 10-month-old baby girl. My sex life happens to be great. My question is, most of the time I seem um, to... Late, I'm um, sorry, I seem, uh, well, I can't read this. I seem to, oh, initiate the first move. How can I get my husband to make the first move? Uh, it would be a nice change. Okay, that's a, a very fair question because sometimes we hear that from men. We hear from men that how come they always have to initiate? Mm -hmm. In this case here, um, talk is necessary, not a talk in bed. He, she ought to take the initiative again one more time and to say, let's go out for dinner. Let's take a babysitter, go out for dinner, and then she should say, honey, what I would like us to do is two times I'll initiate, and one time you initiate. He's not going to mind that. Yeah. But it has to be spoken about because he might not know it. Maybe he listens to us tonight. If he does, he will get maybe the idea of saying, hey, it's true. It's always her who says, how about it? Very often, we hear the reverse. Yeah. that the guy says he always has to do it. Okay. Well, that's not a major problem, though. That's no, a, that's but it's okay. a communication problem. Yeah. Well, most of I these are, aren't they, generally? Yes. Isn't that what we run into here? we talked about. Uh, Dr. Ruth, uh, what do you think of Billy Martin's new four-year contract with the Yankees? <laughs> no comment. No comment on that. That's a joke question. Do we have time for one more, or we got to find another question here? Uh, all right. 28-year-old uh, male. Oh, good. What effect does alcohol have on sexual performance? Good question. If the guy is drunk, 
then we don't have to talk about sexual performance. Yeah, it, uh, it has a if, negative effect. Right. It? If he just drinks a glass of wine or a glass of beer, uh, then it might uh, be very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But if he drinks to such an extent, we know that he's going to have trouble having an erection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's just common sense, isn't right. it? All right, well, thank you very much for being here. We have to pause for a commercial, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll be back to see how the folks did on their visit to the doctors. Thank you very much. As you know, earlier in the show, we sent two audience members down to the doctor's studio along with ex-doctors actor Alec Baldwin. Uh, their mission has been completed, and they're back with us in the studio to report on what they've uncovered. First of all, Alec, uh, when you left earlier, you seemed to be pretty bitter. How do you feel now? Uh, seeing the place where I used to work uh, <laughs> only made me feel more bitter. <laughs> Geez, Alex, this bitterness seems to be eating you alive. Good heavens, try and relax, if you will. The other two members of this crew were uh, Betty Wilson. Betty, uh, nice to see you again, and Han Wells. Uh, Wells Han. I'm sorry, Wells Han. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's hot. Uh, what, what, did you, uh, what did you folks find on your mission to the uh, third floor there? Well, what we found, first of all, was a cue card. All right. Hold that up to this camera, Wells, and if you read off a little and see what the... This could be the secret to the uh, what's happening. You want to uh, read it? It was a joke, Doctor. You always had a rather frightening sense of humor. We were just fooling around, Doc. No problem. Tell me, Ken, uh, how are you feeling today? Well, that's pretty nonspecific stuff. Betty, you have some photographs there, right? Yes, it's a payoff, obviously. A payoff. We have receipts here. White wine. Ooh, two bottles of white wine. And pretty good stuff. Six, bo six bucks for two bottles of white wine. <laughs> And this one looks like $20 for pie. I don't know. <laughs> Wine and pie. Well, all right, you have photographs? Yes. Okay. Well, this is a photo of just what we've seen. This is Wells or mm -hmm. Han or whoever this man claims to be holding a... Uh, is there any point in seeing this? There. So much more exciting when you see the actual photograph, isn't it? What else do you have, Betty? Uh-oh, this could be trouble. A big jar of placebos, it says on there, huh? Okay. And let's see, one more. I can't read this. You know what that says, Betty? Please return women's room key to the doctors. Hmm. Well, I don't know what to make of all of this. It certainly has been a lot of fun, though, hasn't it? Uh, did you enjoy your visit? I think this one's important. This one is important. Here we have a... Uh, oh, this, this appears to be our crew up there. <laughs> These are the gentlemen that are working on this program, and they were up there just sort of sitting around? Oh, great. Okay. All right, fine. Uh, thank you very much, Betty and Wells. Thank you very much. Alec, pleasure. Appreciate your help. We'll be right back. Uh, we got to go. I want to thank Andy Kaufman, Ruth Westheimer, all the dog owners, Betty Wilson, Wells Hahn, and of course Alec Baldwin. Our studio audience were terrific. Thank you for being here. Tomorrow night, Pee Wee Herman and Devo. Have a good night.